Let's talk about a different type of isolation, isolating things that we deploy. Not isolating our own work or isolating scripts, but isolating applications. This question is titled, how do I isolate deployable applications? And this question is about things that I'm sure you've heard of or even used, Docker and Podman. We'll talk about common tools for isolating deployed applications, and what we'll see is, largely, it really is just a BRAP-like mechanism for creating mount namespaces and C groups and whatnot, plus a UnionFS mechanism, and then a lot of infrastructure for automatically pulling and deploying packages. Let me show you what's going on. Here, I have a data file. It's got the numbers from one to six. And here I have a very simple Docker file. In this Docker file, I say the base is going to be whatever the latest version of Ubuntu is. I'm going to copy this data file into a directory within this image. I'm going to run a command and write that to another file. And I'm going to install Python and NumPy. I'll take a look at what packages I have. I will build this package. Then I'll take a look at what packages I have. And what we'll see is, this Docker build builds an image. In the Docker universe, you're talking about images, volumes, and containers. And we'll talk just about images and containers here. Images are fixed file system layouts that have been set in stone, kind of like that, that base directory if you had a UnionFS system. And in fact, tools like Docker and Podman use these overlay file systems, whether it's UnionFS or Fuse Overlay FS or whatever the case may be. They use that to take that base level directory and then capture all runtime changes. And when you look at the hashes of things like these images, this is actually a hash of the contents of that directory. What Docker adds is this ability to build these, to run commands, to mutate that file system, and where if you look at the Docker command, you can see it has these intermediate containers and whatnot. Every command that you run builds a new layer so that we can share this quite a bit. So, I don't have to do the full Ubuntu install. I can take the existing Ubuntu install and just layer on top of it my two changes, or sorry, my three changes, the data file, the data file I created, and the installed software. And if somebody wants to take that and add a couple more specific changes, they can do that. And so if you look at something like the Python Docker container, or sorry, the Python Docker image, it might be Python built on top of Debian, built on top of something else, and there might be some layering of this. And if you want, you can find exactly that one layer, which you can fork off of and add the things that you need in your life. Well, what I can do with this is I can run this container with some particular code. And so here I have some code that's going to run within this container. It's going to run my Python 3. And here you go. I ran some code against this container with these two data files. Now, one of the nice things about Docker is because it has these hashes for these layers, if I try and run this Docker build again, it'll run instantaneously because it already knows that all the dependencies, which this Docker file is listing, haven't changed. And so these layers won't change. And those hashes are content hashes of that layer. If I change this slightly, for example, I install pandas as well. Well, the previous layer that had NumPy and Python installed, but not pandas, will still be somewhere there. I might have to clean that up later. It'll create that one new layer. But any one of the steps beforehand that might have run, that might have been slow to run, those won't get rerun. And so generally, there's a certain art to writing Docker files. The art is to keep the churn layers closer to the bottom and to keep the slow layers closer to the top and to hope your slow layers aren't the layers that churn a lot. Because that way, you can just make, you can reuse, you can reuse any of the layers that have already been built. And here you go, you can run a simple container. Now, one important thing to understand is Docker on Linux is not a virtual machine. It's running with your exact kernel. It's just like a BRAP with a separate file system tree with a UnionFS to manage it, and that's more or less what it is, plus a little bit of mechanics for the Docker build stuff, a little bit of the mechanics for figuring out what's running, a little bit of the stuff for pulling things from GitHub and from Docker Hub. But beyond that, the core of it is really just these namespaces and these overlay file systems. In the uh, Docker world, we have these containers. And what containers represent our running instances of a particular, oh boy, pandas takes a long time to install, running instances of a particular image. And what you can do with this is you can have one image that runs multiple times, but each time that container shuts down, well, you don't have changes to the image state. You can run from the same image. And this is why you can do things like, you know, uh, deploy a Docker image that runs identically on everybody's machine, and they can run three of them at the same time, and they don't interact with them, because each one of these containers has that file system, that, Fuser, that uh, Fuse overlay FS file system at the top. 
Here, if we take a look at our images, we'll see these images have a hash, and really what these hashes are is just, you know, a content hash that you can tie into actual files on disk that represent the underlying content. The content hash that I created for this one EFF is really just here in this directory on disk somewhere here, it's right here. It's just this file that creates the file system when I launch this particular image. And the rest of these are other file systems for other images that I have or file systems from past running containers that I haven't cleaned up yet. Well, an important thing about Docker is it's not isolated from your underlying operating system other than through these same BRAP mechanisms, these mount namespace mechanisms, and that you that uh, fuse overlay FS. Of course, the situation on Windows and the situation on Mac OS is different, but on Linux at least, it's running with exactly the same kernel that you have. It's just isolated in that fashion. And so what you can think of Docker as sitting somewhere in between a couple of different choices that you have. At the very far end for the extreme isolation, you have a virtual box or VMware or QEMU virtual machine. Completely isolated, doesn't have to be the same kernel version, doesn't even have to be the same operating system. You could have Linux 3.0 running on a machine that's running Linux 5.0 and it's completely isolated, everything is isolated. Now, obviously, in order to do anything fancy, you might need to find some ways to poke holes in that, and that's where using these can be a little bit clumsy. For example, if you wanted to run games within that, well, you need access to your graphics card. You only got one of those. You need direct hardware access to it. And so what ends up happening when you're running something like QEMU is you start having to poke holes strategically in that QEMU virtual machine to figure out how to get access back to core me mechanisms you need, like f folders on disk that you want to have visibility into, or parts of the network so you can actually connect with the outside world or physical hardware like USB devices or graphics cards. At the other far end, it's like your env base containerization, which really isn't containerizing much at all. It's just setting some environmental variables and the process is responsible. And somewhere in the middle, closer to the env side, you have tools like BRAP, and then closer to the VM side, you have tools like Docker. Largely, Docker is basically a way for you to be able to create really slim, really simple things that are almost as isolated as VMs, but they share the same kernel, and you have a little bit easier of a time being able to share things with them. One critical note about Docker, and one reason why I would say I'm very judicious about my use of Docker, or and why I'm very interested in looking at tools like Podman, or why I might be interested to look at those like Podman and RKT. I've mentioned that we want to be able to do things without system level access, without root level access. I want to be able to do some things as just a regular user. And it's not because I don't like typing sudo, and it's not because I don't like typing my password over and over. It's because part of isolating is isolating myself from things that I might do that be destructive that are problematic. You know, when you type sudo all the time, you always wonder, uh-oh, if I accidentally sudo and I, and I slip, and I sudo rmrf, no preserve root slash, all bets are off, I just did something really destructive and I'm going to have to spend the weekend rebuilding this machine. Well, part of the reason that I want to have user level permissions and restricted user level permissions is not just security, it's also there's only so much I can get wrong and I can do wrong. And tools like BRAP allow you to work within that framework and minimally require you to do anything like escalation of privileges. Docker, however, works very differently. Docker has a central set UID process that you communicate over a sock with that runs as root. If you have a machine and you don't have set, you don't have sudo no password set on, so you actually have to type in your password, but you also have Docker access, you might as well not have required anybody type in their password for sudo. Because Docker by default runs as root. If you have the ability to start Docker containers, you can mount and have visibility into any part of the file system. You can create set UID binaries, you can impersonate the root user. If you have Docker access, that is equivalent to having unprotected, unpassword protected root level access. And that's a little bit scary because you never know, you know, maybe you accidentally download a script written by one of your coworkers and they didn't mean to do anything malicious, but they were having a little bit of fun and they wrote some commands that will start a uh, you know, some sort of minor in the, in the background or something like that. And you want to isolate yourself a little bit more. You want to protect yourself from that. You never really know what you're running. Of course, you have to have faith in, in the software that you run to a certain degree because you're not going to audit every single line of code for every single thing that you run. But largely, where I'm a little bit uncomfortable about Docker is 
it really just opens up your permissions completely. And you might as well just be running everything as root. Because once you once you have Docker and you have the ability to start Docker containers, you can just start a Docker container, mount anything you want, and then do whatever, thing, do whatever you want there. The other thing about Docker is, it's, as a consequence of this, it's not as well integrated with the command line. We'll talk about this when we talk about the mindset. But Docker is somewhat disintegrated from the command line. It's very user friendly. But for example, because it is really just dispatching commands to a central tool, if, for example, you're doing things with some sort of fused file system or doing something within a BRAP, it's not guaranteed that any arbitrary doc command will be able to see that because it's not actually necessarily running the commands as the user who's typing the commands in. It's dispatching them to a central tool, which is then running the commands. And so that level of indirection starts to break things and it starts to break certain assumptions that you have about the general Unix model. Tools like Podman and RKT are a little bit better integrated with this Unix model. Tools like System Systemd and Spawn, they're a little bit better integrated with this Linux model. So they, they tend to work better in a scripting mindset, and they tend to allow things that you'd expect to work to just work. But that said, Docker is one of the most popular of these tools. It is the tool that really got people excited about C groups and namespaces. It is the tool which everybody else is compatible with. You know, you can build Docker files with Podman just as easily you can build them with Docker. And it's a tool that many of us use. And so to a large degree, what I would say about Docker is it's something that's worth using, but be a little bit judicious. And where possible, choose to use something a little bit light, lighter weight than Docker, or alternatively, try and figure out how to run rootless Docker, like Docker within Docker. But you know, that itself has its own limitations.